you are the director of women's health at Cabrian Biopharma and the co-founder of Oviva Therapeutics, which focuses on ovarian function and longevity in women. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to ask if you could talk about the unmet need in women's health, which you've been so vocal about, and what drew you to focus on ovarian function bes besides the obvious? Um, you're, you're a woman, of course, but you, uh, you also talk about some very interesting things that uh, men and women should be interested in if you have women in your life that you care about. So could you talk about some of the unmet needs and how women are being left behind in, in studies and uh, healthcare overall and, and what drew you to focus on the specific ovarian function? Yeah, I mean, obviously this is a space that I'm deeply passionate about and it's a bit funny how it came about. Um, obviously I'm a woman, um, but I never studied women's health particularly. Uh, it wasn't really something I, I thought a ton about other than, of course, being a woman. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 30 or 31 years old, I, I went through a breakup with a long-term partner and I knew I wanted to have children. And so I was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not like in a concerning position, but I'm 30, I'm not getting any younger. And so let me just, you know, see if I can learn anything about my own fertility potential um, to make sure that if there's any problems, I can address them now. That was, that was sort of my point of view. And really, I probably only had that point of view because my older sister had a little bit of struggle with her fertility, um, largely related to her type 1 diabetes I mentioned before, which is, is very common for people that have chronic illness of any kind. Um, and, you know, I have a couple friends who had some fertility issues as well, and it's an extremely emotional and, and devastating problem to have to manage. And so I was just not nervous about it, but I you know, in, in my ideal life, I, I find a partner who I want to build a family with and then I build that family and it's all hunky-dory and somewhat straightforward. And, and that's not true for a lot of people. That's not how it works out. And as a single 30-year-old woman at the time, I didn't want to be in a situation where I'm going out on dates wondering at the first date if this person can father a child. <laughs> you know? Like, I didn't want that. Yeah. So, um, I just didn't want the stress. I'm going to need you to pee in this cup before this. Yeah. Just, uh, We're just going to do a little genetic test to see our compatibility. Um, yeah. <laughs> so anyways, long story short, or maybe not so short, but um, the story is that I, I went to speak with um, a mentor of mine who's married to the mentor I had for undergrad. She's an OBGYN in, in Los Angeles and runs a fertility clinic. And, and she kindly sat down with me to just sort of talk about that kind of stuff. And she's like, you know, I know you're a scientist, but I always like to, in my first consult, just kind of explain how the cycle works and, and you know, what we look for in fertility. And, and then if you need intervention, what that, what, what we do for that. And I was like, yeah, just start from the beginning and the basics and just assume I know nothing. And, you know, I'd rather just kind of like start at the bottom and, you know, capture anything I didn't randomly know. And I thought to myself, I probably knew most stuff. And what I was horrified and embarrassed to learn was that I was completely ignorant about so much of what my own body does and how it works in a monthly cycle and how that relates to different aspects of my health. And it just was eye-opening because most of what I learned that day was completely new information to me. And I had a PhD in biology. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, oh my God, if, if a scientist doesn't know these things that are kind of basic um from the standpoint of like how things work mm -hmm. most people probably don't know anything about it and and it's integral to our health and so i started just on this learning journey basically about women's health about like you know female physiology and i started learning a lot about menopause which is the next sort of big hormonal transition in a woman's life and you know it's funny we think about we think about being i don't know i guess i was in like fifth grade or fourth grade or something like that when we first had talks about puberty in classrooms you know we have like a formal setting where we talk about puberty and what happens to your bodies and you start growing mm -hmm. hair and like girls will get periods and like you know I think most of us remember some sort of awkward class like that in school when we were when we were young kids yeah and then at some point you have sex ed where you talk about pregnancy and contraception or hopefully I know a lot of places don't do that but um, you know, you, you presumably are learning something about that as well. 
And there's never really any structured time after that where, where women in particular learn about how their bodies change. And of course, all of our bodies change with time, but, but the ovaries that women have distinguish us in such a way that we really do have distinct physiologic phases in our life that dramatically affect not only our health and well-being, but our ability to cognitively function, to sleep, um, the immune function, sexual function, all of these different things. And the fact that we don't really have a place for the fertility conversation and the timeline associated with that. And then the menopause conversation, which is probably one of the most important pieces of information that you really need to know as a woman, it just doesn't happen anywhere. And I just became increasingly furious that there was all this information that wasn't anywhere that wasn't accessible and it took a lot of work for me to go and, and find it and you know as I got deeper into learning about that I was um, even more enraged and horrified to learn about the the utter lack of attention and funding that's been gone that's gone to female physiology in general so when we think about science as as like a franchise as a, as a thing that's that moves forward the needle on human health women have largely been left out of that. And that's in part due to the um, perceived complexity of the hormonal cycles of women and of female creatures, because you know, in, in, in a lot of biomedical research, we use mice or dogs or um, you know, other species. <clears throat> and for the vast majority yeah. of time, we've used only male animals because they're simpler and it reduces the variability in the signal. Um, that you're looking at. So it makes the data cleaner. That's what's thought to be true. And so what that means is that for decades and decades and decades, we've understood human biology only in males. And so when women go to the doctor to be diagnosed for something, if they're experiencing symptoms, they often aren't properly diagnosed because we've only really put together the diagnose, diagnostic parameters for men. And so women are often misdiagnosed. They're often sort of you know, in a medical setting, um, their, their, their pain and their symptoms are not noted in the same way and they don't get the same type of care that men get because we don't have as well characterized a, a, an understanding of, of what's happening in females in general when they're healthy and then when they're unwell. And similarly in drug development, last little thing and then I'll mm -hmm. get off my soapbox and let you ask another yeah, question. Yeah, um, in drug development, it's also been similar where we've largely developed drugs and tested safety for even consumer products in males and male bodies. And so what that means is a lot of drugs that have been pulled off the market for adverse effects disproportionately negatively impact women um, in a huge level. And some of that's a dosing issue because obviously like there's kind of size differences in adults. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's more so that our physiology is different and we just haven't taken the time or the care to understand more deeply how a female body is different from a male body at the physiological level and how this relates to disease pathology, wellness, mm -hmm. and, and therapeutic use. Yeah, there, there's a lot there. To, uh, to, to go <laughs> back to, uh, I wanted to go back to fertility because you, you started off by mentioning an experience where uh, you went to a doctor to discuss fertility and you realize that as a, a, a PhD candidate and a, a scientist researcher that you didn't know nearly as much as you thought you did or you, or you didn't, uh, th there's a lot of information that you weren't privy to. And as someone like a scientist, um, that's, a, that's obviously a, uh, that's an interesting, that's an interesting gap, and, and I, I don't know if it, it probably says more about the way that society goes about distributing that information, that, it, that it's not mm -hmm. being uh, distributed through the literature. W what are some of the most fascinating things that you learned about female fertility? Some of the things that you, some of the things that you probably uh, should have been introduced to by either teachers or uh, just you know, maybe YouTube videos or, or people spreading information online. And I, I'd obviously never ask you to share any uh, specific medical information, but at a general level, what, what are some of the most fascinating things you learned about uh, fertility uh, that the average woman would be interested in or probably should know for her own good? Sure. I mean, part of it's like the, the question you're asking is specifically about fertility, but if you don't mind, I'll expand that a little bit just to like female physiology, which yeah. intimately ties with fertility, but they're yeah. 
their relationship and they're not the same. I mean, one mm-hmm. of the things that continually blows my mind, even though I've now known it for quite some time, is that our ovaries reach their maximum potential before their first use, which is to say, you know, generally speaking, our ovaries are, they house all the eggs that we'll ever have for our whole life. I think most people, most people tend to know that. Some people might not, but you know, you're, when you're born as a female person with ovaries, you have a whole set of eggs in your, in there that are waiting to be used during your reproductive lifespan. You don't start ovulating those eggs until you hit puberty and then you have your period. And then generally speaking, you have one egg a month that's released, that's available to be fertilized. And over years, the eggs that are in your ovaries diminish. And once they hit a certain low threshold, that's when menopause is triggered and and essentially you lose fertility and um, you stop producing a lot of hormones and a lot of terrible things happen (laughs) for the the large part. Your aging is accelerated and all these other systemic disturbances happen to your body. Um, But what's interesting is that the eggs that are produced for a woman are actually, they're made in utero, which is to say that... Um, you know, if, if you're a woman carrying a female baby in a pregnancy, that female baby starts growing her oocytes and actually reaches the maximum number she'll ever have in her life at about 20 to 23 weeks of gestation. So a 20 to 23 week pregnant woman with a girl inside of her will have, the girl will have like 6 million eggs. And then by the time she's born, she'll have like 1 million eggs. So while she's still in the body of her mother, she's already lost the vast majority of the eggs that she's ever produced. And then by the time that puberty starts, when you actually can use those eggs, there's only about 300,000. And then the thing that really blew my mind, because we all think like, okay, you can get pregnant, you know, at some point in your cycle because you release an egg once a month. You actually are producing about a thousand eggs every month. And only one of them is, is chosen basically to be presented and available for fertilization. So every month that you're cycling, you're losing a thousand eggs from your ovarian reserve. Um, And if you're taking birth control pills, for example, that doesn't change. Like you're still losing the eggs every cycle, regardless of whether or not you're actually able to get pregnant um, or not um, as it relates to birth control pills. And so that was something that really shocked me of like, oh, it's not just an egg every month I'm losing, it's a thousand eggs every month that I'm just losing all the time, yeah. <laughs> constantly. And you're just like, you're approaching this cliff and then you fall off the cliff and then you know you have all of these things happen because the, the lack of the hormonal regulation that we are accustomed to for all of our lives changes. And you know, I think there's lots of memes out there about like hormonal crazy women, but our, ho- our, hom- our hormones are... Well, first of all, men have hormones too. I'll just say that. And and one like funny thing I'll say about that, which I also learned, which isn't related necessarily to female physiology, mm-hmm. but is related to male physiology that I thought was interesting and came out of this work to understand sex differences, is that um, men can vary widely in their hormonal levels. I mean, we were talking about testosterone earlier and steroids. And um, as part of this understanding of, of males versus females, some researchers were looking at the hormonal differences between animals to understand, you know, is there cyclical fluctuation of men, or sorry, of hormones mm-hmm. in males? And testosterone is something that fluctuates wildly, as, as you as an athlete should know. You know, if you're like in a super high training regimen, your testosterone generally is increased. And that, that also creates a different feeling in your body. I mean, I'm an athlete as well, so I know when I'm in like a super heavy training paradigm and my testosterone is up, I have a different kind of energy about me. Um, Mm -hmm. And so they found that, you know, animals, male animals also have a lot of fluctuation in their hormones um, and, and women do as well. And I think it's important that we understand that so that we can manage it when it's feeling a bit unmanageable, whether that's because you're Mm -hmm. going through puberty or because you're going through menopause or because you're pregnant or because there's some other hormonal disturbance, that's real physiology that's affecting your ability to, be present to cognitively function, to sleep, to manage stress, um, your cardiovascular system, your immune system, those are tied to that as well. And so, you know, I think it's something that we really need to acknowledge is important and serious and not just some flippant thing that, you know, oh, women and their hormones, you know, which I think it has been the attitude for a really long time. Yeah. And I can imagine if, you know, the, the stigma that 
women are acting a certain way because of hormones and there are hormones pumping through the body, both male and female, that maybe those hormones aren't being researched as much as they should because of the, the stigma or maybe uh, people might shy away from exploring that because they don't want to to prove, uh, not prove men right, but if there is a connection between hormones and behavior and by understanding that you can live a more fulfilling life, um, mm-hmm. that stigma may lengthen the period of time to which that comes to fruition because people may not want to even touch that or they're like, oh, you know, that doesn't matter. Like, it's just chalk it up to, uh, it's her time of the month or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, recognizing that hormones in all creatures are critical for us to be able to live and and they affect our experience of the world so you know we've talked a lot in this conversation just about resilience and well-being and i think that's ultimately from my really early work when i got into science and was interested in stem cells to now the through line is i want to do work that supports well-being in humans and i'm just sort of following a path that i'm using different ways to do that over time that, that the way i'm doing that is changing but the why is staying the same and and I'm really excited right now because with Oviva Therapeutics, what we're aiming to do is really expand not only the work itself, but the awareness of the work, the funding into the work, and really elevate the ability of, of us as a broader society to, to understand ovaries, ovarian function, hormones mm-hmm. in the body, how they're deeply intimate with our health and well-being at a broad level and how they are connected to our, our health span and our longevity. And, and those are things that are kind of obvious um, when you actually mm-hmm. look at the science and you look at the data. They're so intimately connected, and yet they've been so overlooked and so underfunded, which in, you know is completely infuriating, but in some yeah. ways is really exciting because there's so many open questions that are basic, which makes me very, very mad. But but makes me also excited because there's so much discovery to be had that can be had relatively rapidly because we just haven't asked the question or no one's put money into it. So, you know, we're excited to drive that forward. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. As a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full uncut two plus hour episodes of the Auxoro podcast, plus gain access to two bonus episodes every month at auxoro.supercast.tech. Link is also in the description. Thank you so much for supporting quality content from independent creators like myself. Cheers.